All right, good morning, folks. What's cracking? Today is Tuesday, July 18th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 410 of the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Gerald Ozier, and over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Space Tacos, Terrence Banks, Jeff Watala, folks on LinkedIn, John De La Cruz, People in YouTube land, people in LinkedIn land, Simply Cyber squad members, community members, newcomers and old timers alike will be shredding through the top cybersecurity news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories. I do not see these stories in advance, nor do I prep for them in any way. So you're getting raw, straight from the hip uh, reaction and response on each of these stories. I do have 20 years of experience in the industry though. So it is informed speculation, (laughs) if you will. But before we get into the news, before we do all that, let me shout out and say thank you to the stream sponsors. I got their logos across the top of the promo card here. But it's important to um, share this with you because A, it allows me to continue to do this every single morning at 8 a.m. Eastern time with zero cost to you. So it's a win-win for everybody. Let me tell you about Barricade Cyber Solutions. My man, Eric Taylor and the gang over there, Casually Joseph, Regular members in the Simply Cyber community, they might even be in chat right now, so say good morning if you are my Barricade Cyber friends. They're dedicated to helping businesses from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for business owners. Thank you, Kimberly. Cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send dedicated hardworking business owners into turmoil. But guess what, y'all? Barricade Cyber Solutions, they know how to mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. They dropped the the chef's salt on a ransomware incident in a hot minute. Bookmark this, believe me. If you're gonna get hit with ransomware, business email compromise, you need incident response, whatever, this right here is your magic button. This is make the pain stop, Jerry button right here. Look at this, you can get on Eric's calendar at 12.30 today. Have a little lunch date with Eric and the Barricade Cyber Team. Get yourself straightened out. Believe me, you will not want to be figuring out what to do when you're dealing with a ransomware incident. Also want to say shout out to Anti-Siphon Training. Guys, if you don't know, Anti-Siphon Training is the training arm of Black Hills Information Security. Also well known for their comics, the Rucka comics, which I got my shirt yesterday. Boom, baby, no porch pirates actually. My neighbor hooked me up and grabbed it, chased me down and gave it to me yesterday. So love myself some Black Hills Information Security. I'll tell you two things. One, if you don't know who Black Hills Information Security is, I absolutely, like, absolutely implore you to check them out. They're one of the best companies in our industry led by great people. Anti-Siphon Training is a wonderful training opportunity. There's live training, on-demand training. Basically, if you want to get skilled up, they have training for all of it. And the most important thing I'd point out is they have three trainings that are pay what you can, led by John Strand. You can see in the emote trays, Kayla Sturgeon, uh, Trey Grady, Space Taco, Shuttle Crab, all dropping um, John Strand emotes. The man is awesome. and. Uh, their motto is sucking at capitalism, if that indicates how they feel about um, delivering quality and value to the community at a price that's ridiculously reasonable. Pay what you can. So go check it out. Also, Panopsi Security, but more about them at the mid-roll, because I don't want to overwhelm you guys with sponsors. Guys, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth half a CPE. And if you don't know what a CPE is, that's okay. If you do have a cybersecurity certification, then you do know what a CPE is. Half a CPE, two and a half a week, 10 a month. They stack up if you're here on the regular, just like Jenny Housley and Billy DP and Marcus Seiler and Carrie are always here on the regular. Jim Lund, you know, let the CPEs stack up. Say what's up in chat. That's one way to document that you're here as far as roll call, grab a screenshot, whatever you got to do, you can always come back. The streams will always be available on replay. I promise you that. If you're live with us, I see 148 of you. Hashtag 
team live in chat. Mono Julian with the super chat. Good morning, Cyberheads. Does anyone have experience with Boyd Clueless program? I want to get a chance to hear a person review that is not their site. Two things. One, Mono for the super chat. Can we just become best friends? Yep. Thank you so much, Mono, for the super chat. Also, if anyone knows anything about Boyd Clueless, uh, let Mono Julian and the rest of chat know, please. And I do want to remind you what Mono just did is absolutely absolutely the best way to do it right like like for example i'm up here talking about anti-siphons training okay they're a sponsor so maybe i'm full of crap but what i will tell you is i have taken anti-siphon training before i have taken john strand's active defense and cyber session i made a video on my channel for it i can attest and affirm that i believe in this uh training right so if you're going to uh do training or boot camp you absolutely need to do your research to find out, is it legit or not? And talk to someone that the the school or the training platform did not, you know, doesn't have a financial incentive to tell you something, right? So hook it up, Mono Julian. I hope you get the answers you need. If you're live, Team Live, 164 of you this morning, uh, I'm sure we're going to get up. We had 280 yesterday, so really love the support coming in from the Simply Cyber community. If you're watching on replay, hashtag Team Replay. Um, love engaging with you all in the comments. You guys are wonderful people. Team Replay are people too. Um, and uh, I do love spending you know 30 to 45 minutes every evening after dinner uh, engaging with the Team Replay team. Uh, if you are first time here, we've got a lot of those people here. Hashtag first timer in chat. If you just found the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief, may I remind you, this is episode 410. So we've been doing this for a minute, friends. So let us know in chat. Um, good morning, coffee cup. Cheers, James. Absolutely. Can we just become best friends? Yep. Got my coffee cup right here in my Simply Cyber mug. I am wearing a pink shirt. I don't think everyone can pull a pink shirt off. I don't know if I could pull a pink shirt off, but I was feeling really, um, I was feeling it this morning. I reached forward in my closet and I said, let's roll with this guy. Uh, cheers to everybody in chat. This is my first slug of coffee. So you know it's a big one for me. Oh my God. Oh, I'm going to have to go back for seconds on that one. Wow. Woo. Mm. Oh my God, there's just something about good coffee, guys. Oh, I'm going to need a minute. Woo! All right, if you're a regular, uh, Matthew Ospinel, Ospini, first timer in chat. Good to see you, Matthew. Thanks for coming in over from LinkedIn. Amaka coming in on first time for... Um, from the CISO series. Hold on. I kind of got, got away from myself here because I, I've been, uh, I'm all excited with all the, all the stuff. Really quickly, hold on, I need something with like some zip. I need something with some zip. Listen, if uh, if you're first time, hashtag first timer. If you're shy and normally in the shadows, step forward and uh, network with us, hashtag passive observer. Let the uh, community welcome you into the, into the chat. Believe me, you will definitely benefit by being uh, social and networking. Um, Queued up says on Tuesdays, we only wear pink. That's very good. Today is Tidbits Tuesday, which means I'll give you a little bit of uh, a personal thing at the mid-roll. Um, so let's get into it. All right, shall we? Oh, I'm getting a lot of pink stuff in uh, DMs right now. That's <laughs> thank you. All right, let's sit back, relax, and let's let the cool sounds of the hot news Mercy! wash over all of us in an awesome, awesome wave. I'll see you guys at the mid-roll. You community members, you guys are the best. I love you guys series it's cybersecurity headlines it's tuesday july 18th 2023 jump cloud breached by apt last week we reported that the enterprise software company jump cloud reset all customer api keys in what it referred to as an ongoing incident now the company disclosed a state-backed threat group breached its systems it discovered an incident on June 27th, finding the attackers gained access a week prior with a spear phishing attack. The company discovered unusual activity in the command's framework for a small set of customers, but said it found no evidence the attack impacted any customers. JumpCloud released indicators of compromise from the incident to better allow partners to secure their networks. Okay, so I covered this. Um, I think I may have gotten spicy on this one last week. I can't remember. Um... But I okay. So, Jump Cloud last week forced everybody to uh, 
to change their API keys. Like they basically um, revoked all API keys. And I went into great detail. You can go back and watch the show. I'm sure no one will, but you can go back and watch the show. Uh, I went at length. That is like a nuclear option for a business, okay? You are absolutely going to piss off many, many customers and break lots and lots of applications because the API keys will be revoked. But JumpCloud made that decision, okay? Uh, believe me, that was not a decision made lightly. Now more information is coming out. This is consistent with what I was thinking. Um, an, APA, an APT had uh, breached them. APT, Advanced Persistent Th Threat, typically state-sponsored. So um, it very sophisticated skill level, well-funded, and incredibly um, focused on whatever the mission is. So I want to say a couple things that's really awesome. One... Uh, initial infection with spear phishing. So, you know, phishing continues to reign supreme as like the initial attack vector. Um, this is really good. One week after the breach is when they discovered it. Guys, in our industry, there's a thing called like dwell time. Okay. So, okay. When you talk about um, metrics in information security, that's a GRC, you know, thing. Like we love our metrics, right? But metrics has always been like, um, you know, a unicorn or some type of like white whale um, to, to go after. Like metrics are really hard. And people will talk about number of vulnerabilities patched or number of fishes stopped and stuff like that. But Wendy Nather, who's a longtime uh, seasoned industry pro, once said, like, when, when, when evaluating, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, but when, when evaluating umbrellas, right, the board doesn't want to know how many raindrops the umbrella stopped, right? If I told you, like, this is a great umbrella, it can stop 95,000 raindrops an hour. You'd be like, what? The question is, do I get wet or not? Yes or no, right? So metrics, you can, you can craft up some metrics, but they're not really valuable. One metric that's really valuable is dwell time. How long from someone getting into your system till you detect it, right? That boom, boom. So... Left and right of boom, like right where boom's happening, how long does it attack to take you to detect boom? That is a valuable metric. And ransomware has screwed it all up because vendors are pumping their chests out saying, oh, we, we've brought dwell time down to minutes. It's like, yeah, minutes because the freaking threat actors are announcing that they've they own your box and they've encrypted everything. You can't count that. So you have to remove ransomware from the equation when you're calculating dwell time. Okay. Ooh, this was not a ransomware incident. This was a sophisticated state threat, uh, state-based threat actor who spearfished in and got access to mastery API keys, which would mean that they could do whatever they want with applications of this company's service. It took them one week to discover this. This is excellent. Back in the day, guys, like when I was like, you know, in my spring of my career, it would take like a year, like 400, 500 days uh, before detection. It was gross. Uh, so one week is exceptional. So good, good job, Jump Cloud. Jump Cloud is saying, um, what does Jump Cloud do? It says it here. Um, they do say that their strongest line of defense was through information sharing and collaboration. Absolutely. That's another modern, you know, anomaly. Like it used to be back in the day, you would like keep everything in the house and not tell anyone anything. That's not the case anymore. I wanted to know like what Jump Cloud service is. It's a directory as a service, which made no freaking sense to me. Jump Cloud is a directory as a service platform. I, okay. Providing single sign on MFA services to over 180,000 orgs in 160 countries. Okay, this makes even more sense why Jump Cloud uh, ripped the Band-Aid off almost instantly. No brainer. So they're kind of like what I think like Okta does. So they are a platform that allows you to kind of offload or 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 outsource authentication, right? So you can have your authentic. You can have like basically like Jerry at SimplyCyber.io log in to uh you know uh thousands of different apps and services, right? You ever seen the button on uh, web apps where like, it's like, oh, create an account or log in with your Google or log in with your Facebook or log in with your Amazon, 
right? Like those buttons, that's federated authentication. You're leveraging your Google creds in order to authenticate to that system. And they've set it up in the back end through identity uh, providers and, and authentication providers to, to enable that. And that sounds like what Jump Cloud is doing here. So if Jump Cloud got uh, popped, it makes an F load of sense now that they would want to um, revoke all the APIs because basically the threat actors could potentially log into anything now, uh, which is obviously gross and um, in in the pantheon of bad for authentication businesses, allowing a threat actor to log into anything that's like that's like hitting an iceberg in the Titanic. Like that is catastrophic for the business. So way to go, Jump Cloud. Way more meat on this bone than I thought. I thought this was going to be like one of those like little cheesy, crappy chicken wings you get where you're like, bro, there's like no meat on this wing. This thing right here, this is a uh, hormone injected, big fatty. Uh, chicken wing um, story. Okay. Thank you, Jump Club. Wisconsin allegedly hit by LockBit. Landglade County in northern Wisconsin announced a catastrophic software failure last week. County officials did not directly attribute this to a ransomware attack. However, the LockBit group added the county to its list of victims on its leak site. It threatened to leak county government data if not paid a ransom by August 1st. The incident resulted in all direct phone lines to the county sheriff's office becoming non-functional, with 911 calls rerouted. The county's health department and emergency management service was also impacted. Over the last year, Lockbit has attacked local governments in Colorado, Florida, Ohio, and California, so Landglade County attack seems credible as well. All right. Typo. All right, a couple things here. One, um, Lockbit continues to uh, grind, right? Um, I will say uh, with the ransomware threat actors, a lot of them like surge. So it's, I feel like it's like peaks and valleys. Lockbit is nice and consistent. Um, now remember, Lockbit is a ransomware as a service model, meaning that they have what they call affiliates um, who basically uh, get initial access and then drop the Lockbit payload. And then the Lockbit ransomware gang handles it from there and the affiliate gets a portion of whatever money Lockbit is able to collect, uh, which is very devastating, especially right now where inflation is high, unemployment is going up, uh, people are getting laid off. So here's the deal. Like, I'm not saying I'm going to commit a crime, right? But if I have, and I do have, like a wife and two children, and I need to provide for them, feed them, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pushed into a corner cause I, you know, can't get work. I, you know, I'm trying all the things right in, in that instance, becoming an affiliate of, of a ransomware gang, it, it, it like it's, it's deplorable and it, it's criminal and I don't recommend anyone do it, but I can see where it looks like an easy button to some people. All right. Wisconsin County, yet another municipality got hit. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google the following, ransomware space, Oakland, ransomware space, Minneapolis, ransomware, Atlanta, ransomware, Baltimore, ransomware, um, oh my gosh, uh, was it uh, Onslow County, ransomware, Spartanburg, South Carolina, ransomware, LA County School District, Municip uh, ransomware, Dallas, is Dallas even back up? They got ransomware pretty heavily a couple, uh, like a month ago, okay, two months ago maybe? Municipalities are getting smacked around and it's well documented that they're underfunded. They've got shoestring budgets. They don't have InfoSec people. They have IT people. I would tell you with, with high confidence, okay? Every municipality in the United States is a good target, okay? It, 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 they just, there's a, there is a continuity. There is a consistency. There is a brotherhood of, of um, you know, crappy situations of underfunded IT, deprecated systems, legacy systems, you know, duct tape holding stuff together. It keeps working. Let's keep funding, you know, other initiatives, unfortunately. Uh, so municipalities are going to continue to get screwed. One interesting thing on this Wisconsin one that's a, a kind of new is that 911 is down. 
Uh, this is the first instance of a municipality going down that I'm aware of where 911 was impacted. Typically, the 911 system is on a, on a separate system, closed loop system. Maybe it's on a plain old telephone system, POTS, if you ever heard of that. Um, so they must have had like either a modern 911 or, you know, somebody... Somebody somewhere said, hey, we could save a couple bucks if we fold the 911 system into this other system. Whatever it was, I'm sure it was done in good good intent, but uh, it's not good. There is a possibility here for, uh, you know, someone's house to be on fire and they can't call the fire department. Someone being, you know, um, you know uh, harassed or attacked by somebody and unable to call 911. So it's pretty gross, pretty serious. Um, you know, sorry, Wisconsin. Good people up there, though. If you ever met somebody from Wisconsin, they're like Minnesota people. They're like, oh, geez, don't you know? We got a 911 issue here. Boy, it's a catastrophic. Leaking military emails. A new report from the Financial Times found that a common domain typo has implications for the U.S. military. That's because the .mil domain used by the U.S. military often gets typed as .ml, the country code domain for the West African country Mali. This isn't theoretical either. Speaking to the Financial Times, a Dutch entrepreneur managing the domain, Johannes Zubier, set up a system to catch misdirected military emails to .ml addresses. Since January, this system captured over 117,000 emails, many including sensitive medical records, identity documents, military base photos, itineraries, and more. Zubier's contract to manage the domain expired this week, so Mali officials could access misdirected emails directly going forward. What the hell? Um. Oh my god. Okay, this is disgusting. Oh my god. All right. So here's the deal. All right. Typo squatting is a whole thing. Okay. So if I type in um like Microsoft.com, but we're, instead of the I in Micros like M-I-C-R-O, I put a one. So it's like M-1-R-C-O or, you know, Microsoft with a one. Okay. Um, the deal is that someone who's not paying attention, Carl, will uh, not look closely at it, click on it and fall for it. It's a classic social engineering attack. You're attacking the human's ability to interpret the URL as something different than what it actually is. We've seen it. People use puny code to get Cyrillic vowels or Cyrillic letters, we've seen, um, you know, numbers instead of like a zero instead of an O. Okay, so this hasn't been done. Um, in the world of TLDs or top level domains, many of us think of .com, .org, maybe. Maybe if you're a hardcore Simply Cyber fan, you know about .io, simplycyber.io, right? There, there are a ton of top level domains. Like, we lost our mind collectively four months ago when Google released .zip, right? There, go check out uh, a bunch of TLDs, top-level domains. Well, every country has one. The United States, we're spoiled because we're the center of the universe. So .com is like basically .com.us, except we don't have to put the .us, just like you don't have to put port 80 after a URL uh, or port 443. It's just assumed it's US-based, right? But if you're in Australia, it's .au. If you're in Seychelles, it's .sy. If you're in China, it's .cn, .ru for Russia, .ca for Canada. You get what I'm saying. Now, .ml is Mali. .mil is the U.S. government. And some intelligent person registered, you know, Pentagon.ml and DOD.ml and Navy.ml and everything.ml. And for years, and this is the part that's gross, for years, people have been sending emails to the wrong account. Hey, here's a wicked sensitive email sent to admin at Pentagon.ml. Like that's, that's the crux of what's happening here. Now, two things to point out. One, and this is what disgusts me. One is that the guy who's been running these domains has been trying to contact the United States, both formally and informally, for years and has been unable to do it. Okay, so thank God that this guy obviously seems like a white hat 
seems like a good person, seems like he wasn't using those secrets for financial gain or for national security compromises, but whatever. The fact that he wasn't able, he went through Dutch diplomats to seek U.S. Uh, officials and was unable to do it. How is this falling on deaf ears? To me, this goes like to me, this goes back to like information security circa 2003, where you're screaming off the rooftops about how bad cyber is. And the businesses are like, what is that noise? Is that like, what's that buzzing noise? And it's like, uh, like you're killing me smalls. Okay. Uh, now, one one point of exposed risk, I would say, is that this Zuber guy definitely had some, you know, dot ML, like, you know, Pentagon, Army dot ML, whatever. Um, but he may not have had all of them. So there is, you know, risk exposure here that some other entity, state sponsored threat actor, adversary of the United States, whatever, um, enterprising Lord of War, um, owned you know, whatever, like USMC.mil or ML, right? So it's it's no guarantee that this dude owned all of them. Plus he was paying for the registration of all of them. Uh, the final uh, piece of the story here is that uh, I guess something expired and now the Mali government owns all of the domains, apparently. Seems a little odd. I don't know how a government can step in like that and take over all of them. Uh, but anyways, so... Long story short, this is an interesting story. It doesn't look like there was any negative impact. Um, thank God. Uh, but it is a great example of typo squatting. Very easy to convey this to a non-technical person because they will understand .ml and .mil. Um, just goes to show you, man. United States um, military, one of the strongest forces in the world, sending emails to a .ml 117,000 times. Why detecting AI-generated text remains challenging. When large language models like ChatGPT became readily available, tools like GPT-0 quickly followed, claiming to accurately detect text generated with these models. However, a study from the University of Maryland empirically demonstrated these tools are not reliable. Benj Edwards at Ars Technica looked into why they struggle. These tools generally use language models themselves and look for perplexity and burstiness as indicators of human origin. This approach seems easily defeated by both bland and predictable human writing and increasingly large language models being complex. Additionally, users report that foundational text of a given language, like in English, the U.S. Constitution, or Bible passages, become flagged as LLM generated because so much training text becomes based on their idioms. And now we're all right. So yeah, this is like been a whole thing, right? Um, AI detecting AI helps a lot. Um, if now that AI has been around for a while, you can kind of um, see it. If you know someone just like did AI and then copy pasted it, like you can kind of tell. Especially ChatGPT has certain kind of, I guess, indicators. Um, but this is an interesting uh, case study. I, I like it because it's really uh, juicy. They fed it the Constitution, uh, the U.S. Constitution, and it said it was AI generated. Okay, which shows you very, very easily that these tools that are detecting AI suck. Basically, this is a case study to demonstrate. Hey, hey, hey! This is a case study to demonstrate that um, AI detection engines suck. Okay, and I clicked on a link here. Apparently, oh, this isn't going to go here. Apparently, uh, there's a news story here about some professor who flunked an entire class, uh, accusing them all of using AI to write their, uh, their papers. What, what a donkey. Uh, so anyways, AI has got a long way to go. You guys got to remember like AI has only been on the scene for like less than six months. <clears throat> um, so I, I, I will say, um, AI is a force multiplier. If you use it as an, an as an assistant or an aid to aid you in your work, not to replace your work, okay? I will say that about AI. Obviously, I've done multiple videos on the channel <clears throat> on how to use AI, BARD, and ChatGPT to get a job in cybersecurity. Uh, but just be uh, careful, guys. It's a tool to use. It's not, it's, not, it's not to replace you, right? It's a tool to help you. 
and then you know these things are built on language models obviously so uh, that's the deal with them i love this picture though by the way oh this is actually an ai generated image this is even funnier um that they used ai to build this uh <laughs> that's funny all right i gotta let my dogs out here our sponsor open vpn Zach Belhadri, the infrastructure manager at Knight Capital, shares why using Cloud Connexa for his team security has become a game changer. With the CyberShield feature, he's able to prevent malware, phishing, and other threats by restricting access to only authorized and trusted internet destinations. He calls Cloud Connexa an awesome product with huge potential. Read more at the link in our show notes. All right. E Really quick, it is the mid-roll. Um, David Spark, the guy who runs CISO Series, the podcast that we um, piggyback on for the show, uh, asked me, like whoever their, their sponsor is for that day, he asked me to put the promo card up. So I'll be doing that going forward since, um, you know, I, I, I like doing the show the way I do it. So it's not a, it's not a ridiculous ask. Guys, it's the mid-roll. I know that uh, there was a couple first-timers here. This is what we do every day at the mid-roll. Guys, I want to thank all of you for being here. If you're getting value from the show, do me a solid and hit the like button. I know that sounds uh, cringe and trite, but here's the deal. By hitting the like button, you're triggering the YouTube algorithm to tell other people who like cybersecurity to come over here, which is how you may have found it in the first place. So pay it forward. Help someone else find the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing by hitting the like button now. I want to thank the stream sponsors, Barricade Cyber, Anti-Siphon Training, and my man, Brandon Poole, over at Panopsi Security. Panopsi Security delivers value to its clients through many different capabilities, but one particular one that I'm a fan of is their quantified risk assessment. If you're taking over an information security program, if you're trying to mature an information security program, if you're a CISO, Director of Information Security, a one-man band, whatever, a quantified risk assessment will probably take four to six weeks and will give you a three-year roadmap that you can execute against that will be statistically sound in order to reduce meaningful cyber risk with respect to your budget, your time allowance, your current resources and infrastructure, all relative to your business, business size, threat landscape, and the industry you're operating in. I know that's a lot to say, but if, if you know what I'm saying, you know exactly what I'm saying, i.e. you know what the value of a quantified risk assessment. So I'll just leave it at that. Go go check it out. If you are running an information security program and you don't have a plan or strategy, spend the money, get a pro like Brandon to come in and do a quantified risk assessment. It will be worth every penny for the next three years. Now, if you're planning on quitting your job in the next like three months, I wouldn't bother bringing it in. But if you're if you're looking to build something, definitely a good option all right guys i want to say holla to the simply cyber community challenge um kudu chimera i believe kudu chimera if i believe is currently holding the baton we do this every single day first timers the simply cyber community challenge what what we would ask you is um uh, Kudu's going to tag somebody in chat. That person's going to go on LinkedIn and share their cyber story and use the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Any one of you can go on LinkedIn right now and search for the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge and connect with the individuals who are commenting and posting with that hashtag. Why? Because within about a week of doing this, a week or two weeks of doing this, your LinkedIn feed is going to be rich and valuable to you. You're going to be connecting with like-minded people. You're going to be building a professional network. All the posts are going to be relative to things that you either want to know about or didn't know you needed to know instead of getting just random shakes in the LinkedIn stream. Believe me, it is unbelievably valuable. I loved Kuda Chimera's post. My man Kuda, also a runner. Uh, he does marathons, though. I, I can't. I, I do halves, Kuda, so don't hold that against me. Kuda, please tag somebody in chat if you would. Hey, Brad, Theodore, good to see you. While Kuda's tagging somebody in chat, let me holler at you uh, with a Tidbits Tuesday. So every single day of the week has a special little theme. Uh, and Tuesdays is a day that I share a little bit about me, a little something 
Um, I don't know, just to see if, you know, we, we jive with each other on this. So I, I didn't really have something lined up. Um, oh, I, I got something. I have been watching um, Succession on HBO Max. No spoilers. I'm in the, I just started season three. Um, and I figured out why I really like Succession. Succession is basically a story of like um, a really, really wealthy family that owns like a media <clears throat> magnet. Think like Robert Murdoch, right? Um, the reason I like Succession is because it's basically corporate Game of Thrones. It's the same concept as Game of Thrones, except instead of dragons and white walkers and swords and sorcerers, it is boardrooms and modern day, you know, Armani suits and big boats, right? So Succession, if you liked Game of Thrones, minus season eight, let's just put season eight out of the conversation because that was ridiculous. If you liked Game of Thrones, you might like Succession. I'm enjoying the crap out of it. All right, let's keep rolling. You prepares for quantum attacks. A new paper from the European Policy Center makes recommendations for how the European Union should protect member states from quantum-enabled cyber attacks. The paper calls for a new EU-coordinated action plan to prepare for the day quantum computing can easily break traditional encryption, believed to be about five to ten years out. The paper credits the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology's work on post-quantum encryption standards. Yeah. It notes so far, EU member states have focused on so-called harvest attacks, where threat actors gather encrypted data in anticipation of a quantum breakthrough. Yep. Okay. A couple of things here. <clears throat> in case you missed it, because they spelled out the acronym, the European Union is throwing some love at NIST. My man, I heart NIST. That's the reason there's an emote in the tray. Um, <clears throat> priceless pancakes. If you can, please accept the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, or let us know that you do not accept the Simply Cyber Community Challenge, and Kudu can treat, um, select somebody else. Priceless pancake. All right. So the European Union urge how to prepare for quantum cyber attacks. Here's the deal. Um, quantum computers are right around the corner. All right. They've actually solved four quantum computers, and now my understanding is. The challenge isn't the technology. The challenge is cooling down the quantum computer. Because if they don't, if they don't solve it, all right, priceless pancake with the win. Here's the deal: um, the quantum computers they run hot, not not spicy hot, spicy! but hot because they're doing a lot of you know whatever grinding. And uh, if they don't cool them down, they're going to melt and fail, right? So they're trying to solve the cool down uh, problem right now. Quantum computers is going to rip the lid off of off of um, compute power, right? We, bros, we talk about like AI right now, uh, operating in kind of a, a, a binary um, zero and one world. When we get to quantum computer, that might be when Skynet comes online, okay? But here's the deal. And, and there's no level of preparation. They talked about harvest attacks, which I guess is the term we're going to use. I've never heard that term before as a security practitioner. Um, I've heard of harvesting, but that's usually around OSINT um, but right now, if I intercept communications, right, if I, if I do an adversary in the middle attack, right, I, I swim into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and I tap a fiber optic line and I'm sucking up all the network traffic. Well, no worries because it's encrypted, right, bro? Uh, yeah, but when we get quantum computers, you can have a stable, a storage of all this encrypted data. And then you might be able to use quantum computers to break the encryption, right? You run through enough permutations of what the code could be or what the, the um, key could be. And once you get it, you unlock it. And once you unlock it, you can unlock all of the data, right? Now, the data will be old, but it could still have value, right? That's what they're talking about here. So in my opinion, there isn't really much you can do to prep for this because encryption is encryption, right? Unless you're doing like multiple levels of encryption, um, which would just slow down the quantum computer, but you can't stop it. So just know that when we talk about encrypting and breaking encryption and decryption and stuff like that, it's not just about message and transit, right? It's about backwards um, decrypting of ciphertext to see what happened, okay? Uh, I do an entire lecture on crypto in my 227 course. If any of my students are here, I am teaching a summer class right now. Uh, I think we're actually doing the crypto 
lecture this week. So stay tuned for that. That'll be fun. Uh, and if you've been wondering about my Cyber 101, ask me a jaw jacking. I've got a big update for y'all on jaw jacking, which is super exciting. Long story short, quantum computing is going to change things. But just remember, you can't install Windows 11 on a quantum computer, right? Quantum computers are trinary, not binary. Forever, computers have been zero and one. True and false. Zero and one, right? Binary. Base two systems. If you look at bits, bits are either zeros or ones, right? That's that's like ASCII. I mean, ASCII. Hex is base 16. And if you blow out hex, it becomes um, just bits, right? Hex is basically an easy way to talk about bits um, at a higher level, right? It's, so... Quantum computing is zero, one, and zero, one, right? So there's a third state on quantum computing. Binance integrates Bitcoin Lightning Network. The crypto exchange giant announced it completed integration with the Bitcoin Lightning Network. It first indicated plans of this back in May before setting up its own Lightning nodes in June. Users can now deposit and withdraw Bitcoin using the Layer 2 network, essentially allowing for direct payment channels for cheaper and faster off-chain transactions. These transactions are then later settled on the main Bitcoin blockchain. The crypto exchanges Kraken and Bitfenix already offered Lightning Network integration, and Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong also indicated plans to adopt it. Okay. Word. All right. Very cool. So uh, Binance, I'm just going to, let's just talk about this for a second. So Binance integrated Okay, so Binance is a platform where you can store money and, and ch exchange uh, crypto. Okay, so think of it as like TD Ameritrade or uh, like Fidelity uh, or or um, what are these other ones that like uh, you can like altruist. Like you can go and you can trade stocks for money and move money around and stuff like that. Okay, it's kind of like a hybrid between a bank because it's straight cash, homie, and a stock exchange. They've created they've integrated with the Bitcoin Lightning Network, which essentially, like if you've ever bought something online, like like uh, this shirt, right? My RECA bear versus bear shirt that I've been, um, I'm going to wear tomorrow on stream. When you go to buy this from the Spearfish store, which I recommend you go check out, Black Hills Information Security, Spearfish General Store, you can pay with credit card, you can pay with PayPal, you can pay with um, Venmo, I think. The point is, the PayPal and Venmo are different networks to exchange um, money for goods. Forever, we've we've just had like cash or credit card, which is basically a um, you know kind of a roll up of cash, anyways. These other mechanisms, these PayPal's and Venmos, they're networks, and there's trust in that network, and people then accept. Um, it as payment because they know that there's trust that the Spearfish General Store is going to get their $22 or whatever this shirt cost from PayPal. Bitcoin Lightning Network is basically that. Bitcoin Lightning Network is just another vehicle to pay for goods and services with Bitcoin, essentially, right? And Binance allows you to do that. So if you have money in Binance and the Bitcoin Lightning Network is available on the Spearfish General Store, then you can make a purchase using that money. That's all this is, okay? Now, I do want to remind everybody that Binance is currently kind of embroiled in um, some issues. Oh, thanks, Jazzy Jazz. Thank you. I do, uh, I do like the pink shirt from time to time with a little soft blue. I do live in the low country, so, you know, you know uh, <laughs> uh, it is gentlemanly. Uh, so anyways, if you're interested, I wouldn't put any money in Binance or Bitcoin. Honestly, I think the whole crypto space is wicked toxic. This guy, um, CZ, is the leader over at Binance. Um, FTX was a complete scam and um, uh, like a Ponzi scam type thing. And um, the guy who was running it, I can't even think of his name now, SVB, right? Or Sam Bankman Fried, SBF. He was criminal. And he's going to go to jail. And it's good. This Binance guy was like, he was able to topple um, FTX. <laughs> um, but there are concerns that he is also up to no good. Um, so stay tuned. I just wouldn't. Personally, I don't offer financial advice because this is a cyber show. But I'm not putting any money in here. And I am like fascinated. I'm the Michael Jackson eating popcorn meme um, watching Binance from the sidelines deal with the SEC and the FTC and stuff like that.
WordPress plugin log plain text passwords. Three weeks ago, a user reported that the all-in-one security WordPress security plugin from the developer Updraft logged plain text passwords to its site database. The plugin shows use on over 1 million WordPress sites. The plugin not only recorded the password data, but times a user accessed its site. Initially, an Updraft support agent said the issue represented a known bug with the fix coming in the next release. The agent offered the user a beta plugin build to resolve the issue, however, they noted it still persisted. Subsequently, on July 11th, Updraft released a version to no longer save plain text passwords and clear out the old saved ones. Okay. Work. Oh my god. Be Theo. Be Theo. I forgot. So, like, I, I know this is a WordPress uh, story, but really quickly, just on the crypto thing, like, when crypto was at its, like, peak, where, like, when NFTs were, remember when NFTs were a thing? Um, I, I did get into the space, not because I thought I was going to make a million dollars, but like, I was just so curious that I put a little bit of cheddar into the, into the game, right? I bought an NFT because I wanted to understand like, what the heck is going on with all this stuff? Um, and some of these terms like HODL and diamond hands, uh, I forgot about those terms, B. Theo. So freaking toxic. Like, if you sold your NFT, like, the community would turn on you and be like, ah, right? CoffeeZilla does a great job. He's a YouTuber. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, he does a great job of exposing these um, scams and stuff like that. He did a really good one on Logan Paul's uh, Dino Crypto or Crypto Zoo or something like that, a multi-part series. Go check those out. It, it's just, to me, it's it's... I don't know. Like, I guess, hey, Tidbits Tuesday. Like, I just find the, um, I just find the crypto scam space fascinating. I love, by the way, guys, I, I don't know if you know this. There's another Tidbits Tuesday. Like, I love fraud. I love studying fraud. I love studying the, 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 the the human elements of fraud, like why people do it, how people fall for it. I love studying the taxonomy of different ways to commit fraud. Jim Lund and I have talked multiple times about this. My favorite book ever, not ever, but like one of my favorite books is Principles of Fraud Accounting or Principles of Fraud Examination. It's a textbook. Oh God, I love fraud. It's it's just so interesting. Um, okay, so long story short, Diamond Hands, LOL. Um, WordPress, this all in one security plugin, that's what AIOS stands for all in one security was storing plain text passwords. We covered this on the story on like Thursday or Friday last week, terrible plugin. If you're running it, you definitely need to uh, make sure you're either disabled it or you're deleting the log files with plain text passwords. Um, whatever, like this is like, to me that the TLDR here is Verify your WordPress instances in your environment. Educate Carl. Um, I have watched Gamer Payback. Yeah, educate Carl. Um, if because people can stand up WordPress sites pretty quickly, right? So you might have a WordPress site or two in your environment and not even know about it. Not all WordPress instances are going to go through IT or procurement, right? Any donkey, or excuse me, any end user can't. Not all end users are donkeys, so don't. That wasn't like a slip of the tongue. What I'm saying is. Any person, smart or not smart, can stand up a WordPress site on your corporate network for reasons, right? Oh, we're, we're trying to organize for the annual picnic. We want to set up a quick little website for free. Oh, I'll just install this all-in-one security plugin. This seems good. Okay, and now Carl is logging into that website with the same password because he doesn't practice good cyber hygiene. Same password as his corporate email account, and boom, you're, you're toast, right? So... The TLDR, find your WordPress uh, instances, educate your end users who pre are pretending to be web developers, and definitely not use this plugin unless you can prove that it's not logging the plain text passwords anymore. Jailed after impersonating a ransomware gang. Ashley Lines worked as an IT security analyst at an Oxford-based company. The firm suffered a ransomware attack, receiving emails with ransom demands. Lyles took the opportunity to access private email and alter the original ransom demand email to change the payment address to one he controlled. Effectively, he launched a secondary attack against his own employer. The company didn't pay the ransom, and an investigation showed Lyles unauthorized access. A judge sentenced him to 43 months in prison for blackmail and unauthorized access to a computer. Okay. <laughs> you donkey. Now this guy's a donkey, okay? Now, again, going back to our first story about 
lock bit, you know, you get pushed into a corner. Maybe you make decisions you wouldn't normally make. This guy right here, Ashley Lyles, he's going to jail for four years. Why? Because a company got attacked by a ransomware gang. And this jack wagon took it upon himself to modify the ransom letter to put his own bank account or his own crypto wallet or whatever on the letter so the money would come to him. Enterprising individual, I got to give him credit for being enterprising. Pretty pretty clever, right? Like, oh, I'll just I'll just change it in transit. No big deal. So what would have happened is if the employee employer had paid the ransom, if the employer paid the ransom, they wouldn't have got the decryption keys or exiled the data because the threat actor would have said, we never got the money. And then this guy would get the money, right? And then, you know, obviously, here's my thing. If they paid and the threat actor said, we didn't get the money, I'm sure the victim and the threat actor would discuss where the money went, which wallet it went to. Then they would say, that's not our wallet. This is the wallet we sent you initially. At which point they would probably, this is probably what happened. This is probably how the donkey got caught in the first place. They probably said, that's not the wallet we sent. So somebody intercepted it at some point and then they began to investigate. And that's when they found Ashley Lyles came in at 2 a.m. on Saturday and modified a file. Again, I'm speculating a little bit, but um, this, this guy, very short-sighted, um, not really smart, 28 years old, you know, I guess he'll be out by the time he's 32, uh, but blackmailing your employer and extorting them, that's going to be a tough one when they ask him at his next job interview why he left his last job. Uh, cause I was extorting my employer. I could start Monday. Um, So anyways, it looks like in the story that the employer wasn't going to pay the ransom anyways, which means, which is sad because this guy's going to go to jail and he would never, he was never going to get the money anyways, right? He was never going to get the money anyways. He did wipe all his data from his personal devices, but apparently they still had enough, they had enough on him to uh, convict him. So guys, you know why I, I am able to get up every morning at 8 a.m. and do this show? Because I sleep like a baby. Because I don't, I don't commit crimes. I'm not worried about getting caught. I sleep fine. <laughs> Damn, dude. Anyways, this happens. And this is why there's an insider threat program. This is why you can't assume everybody's good intentioned, right? Oh, and the final thing I'll say about insider threats, because this is an insider threat story. Just because... Jerry, you know, like to to put, turn it on myself, just because I'm a good person today doesn't mean that I don't get addicted to like opioids next month, right? Oh, I, be, I break my back and then I'm getting juiced up on opioids at the hospital and then I get out and all of a sudden now I'm addicted to opioids, right? I could turn into a bad guy or a threat actor, right? Anyone could. So it's just, most of the time it doesn't happen, right? Only a small percentage of insider threats really turn out to be malicious. Okay. So I'm not overemphasizing that you need to have like a, um, like a fascist program going on at your business. But my point is the way people behave is temporal. You shouldn't be like, this is why it kills me that like when you do a background screen of someone, when they start at the company and then you never do it again, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying that like people change where they are at a point in time is not who they are five years later, 10 years later, or stuff like that. So it always kind of cracks me up that you're like, Oh, like we vetted you. You're good to go. But like, that's who you are is different. It changes over time. It's temporal. According to a recent Gartner survey, most organizations are looking to. Cons All righty. Let's do this. Oops. All right, guys. I want to say shout out and thanks for a couple minutes over. Thank you, NCC Group and Base Case, for uh, granting me some grace as we go about nine minutes over. Guys, this Thursday, two days from today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be doing Simply Cyber Live. So I do the morning briefing every day, but I also have long-form guest interviews every Thursday afternoon. And this Thursday, my guest is Ipsec. If you have ever done Hack the Box... If you've ever watched a tutorial, you probably know who Ipsec is. This guy is so ubiquitous in our in, in our industry that there is an Nmap uh, arguments. I think it's uh, Nmap-SV-SC-T4 IP address. That's called the Ipsec scan. 
The guy's got a, a, a configuration of Nmap named after him. Okay, that's how awesome this dude is. He's coming on um, stream. We're going to have a fireside chat. I'm really into the fireside chat formats where we just kind of like kick it and see what happens. Very SC Cafe um, vibes. If you guys have been longtime followers of the channel, you know what the SC Cafe is. That's coming around the corner. But I hope you can join us. Um on Thursday. If you were here just for the news, I thank you very much. Uh, hit the like on the way out. It does go a long way. Please have a wonderful Tuesday. And uh, yeah, stay secure. I'm going to pivot now uh, to jaw jacking, which if you're if you're new here, I do the briefing like like legit and end it. That way people who just want to get the news can get back to work or do whatever they need to do. But I also want to hang out for a few minutes uh, ask, answer questions, engage with the community. I, I might be up here running the stream and stuff, but I'm still a member of the Simply Cyber community also. So I, I love hanging out and spending some time. I always have to check my calendar because I don't want to blow off a meeting. Uh, I have time. Let's do it. All right. Let's see what's going on. I need a fire in the background this time. Oh, uh, for the fireside chats. Yeah, we could do that. You don't know this guy, Bashir? Oh yeah, check him out. He's got a YouTube channel that's really popular. Billy DP asks how to find the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Here, look at this. I'm gonna do it on stream right now. I'm on LinkedIn, right? I'm gonna go to, um, ha like I'm in the search bar at the top. I'm gonna do hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge, okay? I just searched Simply Cyber Community Challenge. I'm going to click on posts. Here's Jim Lund's post. Here's Parker Garside's post. Here's Anthony Pensabine's, Renee Mix, Jenny Housley. This is how you do it. Scott Macius. Just go to LinkedIn and search for the hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. It's as easy as that. All right. Oh, Space Tacos. Yeah, Cyber 101. I'll do that in just a second. Sean, have an interview scheduled with Director of IT and HR for that SOC position this week. Yeah, Sean. Giddy up on it. Also, is, is um, I know, dude, a couple people DM'd me. I don't want to blow their spot up because I am, I am very serious about privacy. But a couple people DM'd me about their um, situation in interviews. And I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, I hope that they will... Uh, share with the community also. Oh my gosh. Um, all right. Okay. Uh, Cyber 101. Uh, Jess Bishop, I liked your post yesterday, and I think the super highs outliers are probably throwing off numbers for a bit. Uh, yeah, so Jess Bishop is talking about, I posted on LinkedIn yesterday how um, SOC 1 um, analyst has can have a starting salary of like 96,000. It was actually kind of seen as like a hot take. A couple people push back. Um, I do have to find the source. I had scheduled that post to go out um, like last week. So I don't remember exactly um, what my source was on that, but I, I assure you, I didn't just make that number up. Um, salary really does depend on location, uh, industry, right? So financial sector gets paid more. Um, I know you know, certain businesses are offering other kind of uh, compensation um, instead of cash, right? So maybe if you go with like a really well-known MSP, like um, like Mandiant, for example, and I don't know how much Mandiant pays, but I could see Mandiant not paying the highest salaries in the industry because A, you work at Mandiant, which is awesome. B, they probably have unbelievable training programs um, to, to train you and skill you up. And they just expect people to leave after they get skilled up because they're going to be able to go get more money. But their they're training and their onboarding and all of that processes is probably so dialed in that they can take raw uh, entry-level recruits and build them up pretty quickly. So, you know, there's that versus like smaller MSPs, which might offer higher uh, money or internal SOC uh, people for like uh, Bank of America, Capital One, large hospital systems, things like that. Okay. Cyber 101. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jess Bishop. So FinTech, right? Huh, exactly. 
Uh, I could see in fintech being the thing. All right, so Cyber 101. Many of you uh, already know this, but um, I am working on a course um, that'll be available called Cyber 101. That's the working title. It'll probably stay. It is a semester-long course, so it is it is extensive, right? Probably 50, 60 hours of content. I've been working on it for some time. I have been collaborating with a college in um, New England in order to get it accredited. It will be an accredited course. It will be worth three credits at higher ed institutions if you want to do it. It'll be the equivalent of like an undergraduate um, cyber sciences, computer science course. Um, it'll be worth three credits. And it was approved last week. Like, so basically I have the entire curriculum and what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it and all these other things. And I've been meeting with different people. It's been hard because it's summer and some people aren't available, but it, last week it got approved. And now I have a meeting tomorrow um, to like finalize the details and stuff like that. And then um, the wheel, the like the restraints are off and I'm green lit to build it. I've already built um, probably a, a quarter of the curriculum. And my plan is to go gangbusters and finish it, right? And probably finish it by um, September, okay? Which means it, it'll it'll be ready to rock and roll uh, probably uh, by October, okay? This is a massive course. This is going to be huge uh, for the community. I'm super excited. It's also going to come with a packet that... Like, all you have to do is, like, fill your name out and, like, you'll be able to hand it to, like, any university in the United States. And it, like, the transfer credit part of it will be handled by that packet, right? So you don't have to figure out how to get these three credits uh, accepted by University of Minnesota or WGU, right? I, I, I'd actually be curious to talk to WGU just to use it as a case study because I know a lot of people here uh, do do WGU. So, anyways, I'm super excited um, I'm super excited. I'm hoping, um, I'm hope. obviously I'm going to charge for the course, right? So like, let's be real, but I'm hoping that this course is the final thing that, that enables me to break free from my normal nine to five. If you, if you, if you're reading between the lines, I think that the Cyber 101 course is going to have enough velocity to be able to help me um, do it. So stay tuned for that. I'm super excited about it. Um, let's go. Uh, also, oh, I've been doing this. Guys, let me know in chat um, if you can. And mods, if you can help me uh, see what people are saying. I've been doing this the last couple days. This has been working out really well. Uh, so I do like doing this. I don't know if other people like doing it, but let me know. Um, let's see. Vulcan Cyber is talking about... Let me see this really quickly. How to fix CVE 2023 37450 uh, in iOS and macOS. So this blog post right here is all about this vulnerability. Looks like it's really well done. What's the vuln? How do you... What's it, what, what is it about? How does it get exploited? Next steps. This looks like a pretty well-written blog post. All right. I'm going to drop it in chat. If you want to learn more about this CBE and also support Simply Cyber, because basically every time you click on this, Simply Cyber is going to get a dollar, I think. Um, so if, if you're interested in supporting the channel, um, it'll help go towards <laughs> paying for, um, I don't know, newsletter platforms, um, restream any of the softwares I'm working on. Um, and if, if you don't want to click on it, that's cool. No, no, uh, no shame in that. Uh, Andre Escobar, I got an update, just got promoted to level two consultant. Boom. Nice job. Nice job. Love it. Andre. Um, I was going to play the uh, Wrecking Ball song, but that sound effect doesn't work on my soundboard. So I came in like a wrecking ball. I'll, I'll do manual sound effects if my soundboard is broken in certain areas. But anyways, congratulations. Very happy for you. Guys, I don't know if we just hit like critical mass or something, but we have been making massive uh, announcements in stream, on stream, in chat. 
like got a job, got a job, got promoted, got promoted. Second interview, meeting with the CISO, meeting with the director of IT. Like you guys are crushing it. Tim McDonald, do you have any tips on implementing a stronger cyber policy at a smaller company? I start in the IT department at my current employer on Monday. Okay. Let me see here. Do you have any tips on implementing a stronger cyber security policy? All right. So yes, Tim. So here's the deal. When you write policy, unless the business is buying into it, it's just freaking paper, right? A policy is only effective if two things. One, the tone at the top. So the business enforces it. And two, um, it's well communicated. Now you can implement policy a couple different ways. One is administrative, which means like, and I always like to use the, um, the emergency door, right? Let's say you're at a business. Okay. Allow me to digress for a second. Let's say you're at a business, right? And the parking lot is behind the business and you have to go through the front door and walk around the building, but your, your desk is at the back and you can literally see your car. It's right there. And the only thing between you and the car is an emergency door. And the emergency door has a sign on it that says for emergency use only do not use. Okay. That is an administrative control. There's a policy that says these doors are for emergency use only, but you open the door and go out to your car every single day because who cares about an administrative control? There's nothing stopping you. Now let's implement a technical control. You add a like large speaker to the door. And when the door is open, it goes, womp, 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 right now, the first time you open the door and you, you like set off that alarm, you're, you're going to, you're, you're not going to do it. Right. Because you don't want to call attention. You don't want to be that jerk. There was no negative consequence before the alarm. It was just a sign. And you were like, F it, who cares? Now there is a technical control that prevents you from wanting to do that. Now you're now your behavior has been modified because you will walk through the front door and around. Okay. So there's two different mechanisms there for, for implementing a policy, right? So policy is what are we doing? And then the controls are, how do you achieve whatever it is that we're doing? So for cyber policy, what I would say, Tim, is I would start like it's a small company. So I would start reasonably small, right? I wouldn't try to have this comprehensive information security program that covers all 18 dimensions of NIST. No. How about, um, practical approaches like multi-factor authentic. I would focus on access. Honestly, if I were you, uh, Tim, what are we allowed to, um, uh, like passwords, right? Like what kind of passwords, what's the password policy, multi-factor authentication. We got to have it maybe introduce, um, that cyber should be involved in the procurement life cycle. So people can't buy things without cyber taking a sniff at it. You write the policy, right? You, you have to get management buy-in, right? Management has to review it. General counsel, director of it, you know, whoever HR potentially give it to them, let them review it. Let them comment on it. Why? Because you want them to a be aware of it and B to have buy-in. If they have stakeholder buy-in on a policy, you're way more likely to have it, um, followed and effective because if you do it in a vacuum and you just push it out uh, with all due respect, it could be the greatest policy ever written. It's not going to have traction. People are just going to look at the sign on the door and walk through it anyways, by getting the, the leadership buy-in when someone does violate the policy, you can say, hey, listen, this goes against policy. You like, listen, you just signed, you just stood up a freaking WordPress site on our company network. You can't do that. Bring it down. It's against policy. Now, if the person says, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Okay. Now this is an opportunity for end user awareness. But if they say F you, Tim, I'm going to keep the WordPress site up because I want to schedule a picnic. Well, now you can go to the director of IT or whoever who was involved in the dis in the development of the policy and say, hey, we got this issue. Um, we've got a policy violation over here. I've asked them to shut it down. They're not going to. Um, I need to escalate this. And because you've got the buy-in, you will get that muscle, okay? Uh, I think that was a little bit longer of a response than what you wanted. But believe me, just writing a policy and sending it out there, you might as well you, you might as well make it two ply because it's only good for toilet paper. You have to get buy-in from the leadership uh, through uh, development and also don't overcomplicate the policy. Simple, 
clear language, uh, easy to follow. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for joining my TED Talk. Can I beta test your course? Uh, Kenosis Dean asks, uh, possibly. Um, get back with me. Um, get back with me, Kenosis. I, I always have beta testers for my courses. Um, my course is far from ready for beta testing, but I will have uh, beta testers. Just all I would say is stay stay part of the Simply Cyber community. When, excuse me, when I'm ready for beta testers, I will. That'll be the day that I ask people to step forward and volunteer. Any courses out there that discuss utilizing AI and ethical hacking now and in the future? I don't know of any courses, um, Cyber Jedi Master, but what I would say is that the best thing I could offer right now is that there is a, and I know it's going to suck for some people who can't get there, but Red Team Village, which is a offensive security focused village at DEF CON, is actually having AI Village, like a sub village of a village, in um at defcon this year jason haddix is leading this so it's ai village but because it's in the red team village there's absolutely zero question in my mind that this is going to be a ethical hacking focused use case of ai prompt engineering using it to write scripts possibly how do you use it right this isn't a course this is exactly where i'm going to be at defcon if you're looking for me at defcon i've already decided this year I'm going to be in the red team village. I'm going to be in the AI village. I'm going to be at the bug bounty party at the Rio. I'm going to be talking to Jason Haddix and getting a selfie with him. Cause I think the dude's wicked cool and I'd like to meet him. That's what's up. Do you offer advice offline? Lazaro Rivera. Uh, Lazaro, I appreciate that question. Uh, I have done it in the past, but um, unfortunately the demand for my the demand for my one-on-one -on -one mentorship is high. So it's either like, to me, it's like, I either do it or I don't do it. And I, I, unfortunately the, the short answer is no, I don't. The long answer is um, I, I mentor at scale. I find that I can help hundreds or thousands of people. If I take, you know, the one hour of my time and put it into something, that is a question that I'm getting asked a lot. Yeah, so that that's that. I typically have a video. It's like almost a joke on the channel, but I typically have a video for like whatever question you have. I I, I typically have a video to answer it. Also, Lazaro, I'm happy to do these AMAs where I'm ask me anything, where I'm answering questions in real time. Once I break free and, and get into my own orbit of being my own employer, um, I'm going to start doing more regular AMA streams on the cafe so really quick the cat sc cafe is a new youtube channel that i'll be launching this fall which is going to be super casual so simply cyber will be the formal professional channel and the sc cafe will be my casual cool um channel so the the button down will come off and i'll get more into like uh cyber shirts i suppose although i do that on stream anyways um so anyways yeah lazaro what do I look for in beta testers? Shuttlecrab asks. Um, you know, just a willingness to contribute. Um, I, like, here's the thing. With a beta tester, I need you. Here's the deal. And I asked the people to do this, although I haven't been vigilant about follow through on this. But here's the deal. If you're going to beta test, that means you're going to get access to the course for free, right? If you're going to beta test, what I need in exchange is that you need to complete the course within a reasonable amount of time, one or two weeks, right? So it's work. I need you to work. And I need feedback on the course, right? Does it make sense? Is there a missing part? Are there typos? Um, it, was I not clear about something? Did it feel like I, I spent too much time on something? Like I need constructive feedback because the whole point of beta testing is to improve the overall quality. I'll give you an example. I just released, um, I just released this last week. Um, Simply Cyber, um, Cyber Unlock the Ultimate Guide, right? My book. Download it now. If you need help, right? If you're trying to break in, if you're trying to break in, this is um, a great book. In my opinion, this is a great book. You can get it for free right here, right now. Just go to the website and sign up. Okay. 
I wrote this book. I thought it was a good book. Then I asked um, Virginia Case, the marketing executive. I asked Aaron Katz-Gager, um, Simply Cyber community member and mod. Uh, and I asked Jesse Johnson, um, aspiring uh, information security practitioner, good guy, to review it. Each of them brought a different perspective. That information, that constructive feedback, I used to make the book better. If you'd seen it in its first um, iteration, it was okay. It's significantly better now. And that's what's up. That's how I use beta testers. Because to me, here's the deal. I know for a fact, I don't know everything. I know for a fact, I'm not great at certain things. So by getting other people who can complement and fill in the gaps that I suck at, um, it makes the product better for everybody. That's what's up. Jenny Housley crushing it as a mod. Thank you, Jenny, uh, for, for your support here. Jose Alfredo says, I live in a small town. There's a small company that uses third-party auditors for compliance. Is it possible to do independent GRC consulting or does GRC need an organization? No, you can absolutely, Jose Alfredo, you can absolutely do um, GRC consulting, right? I don't really talk about it, guys. Um, but I own my own company, right? I own a company called Coastal Information Security Group, and I do GRC consulting through that company. I do a lot of risk assessments. Panopsi Security, one of the um, sponsors, they are a GRC company. There's nothing, nothing stopping Jose Alfredo from starting a business called Alfredo Consulting, GRC expertise in a box, and go help people. You can absolutely do that. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's a great idea. The trick is getting a market. And I will also tell you, um, because I was originally targeting small businesses, because if you've read my PhD dissertation, you know that I, I, I care about small businesses. What I found from a consulting perspective, and this is just uh, real, great cash, homie. smaller businesses are reluctant to pay um, good money for consulting. So you know, uh, it, it, it can be a challenging market to pay your bills uh, delivering GRC to small businesses. They operate pretty lean. They don't, they don't necessarily see the value. Um, oftentimes, they can see the value, but I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it, it's tricky, but you can definitely do it. Uh, Shuttle Crab says, thank you very much that and for all the value and your team provide to the community. Absolutely. We are here to serve. I like to say, I don't really like to identify myself as a leader, but the, the phrase, a leader who serves, definitely seems to resonate with me. So uh, I reluctantly um, share, share how I view my position uh, in this community. Okay. Um. Jezbo just received a Digispark. What's a what's a what's a Digispark? Digispark. What's that? USB development board. Oh, cool. Oh, actually, I think I have some of these. I didn't know they were called Dig. I didn't know they were called Digispark. Where are they? I definitely have a bunch of these. Where are they? I got. I don't know about you guys, but I have like a. You know, there's the kitchen junk drawer, and then I have like my technophile junk drawer. And uh, I, I know I have these things. Although, I think mine's an Arduino. Um, uh, uh, or uh, in a, uh, in a Tinity 85, I think, is what it is. But this is really cool. Yeah, very cool. All right, let me... Where are we? There we go. All right, what else we got? All right, I got uh, two more minutes, everybody. And then... Got to get back to the grind. Yeah, Lyle. Lyle Murden says, Lyle approached 30 small healthcare practices and got zero takers. Yeah, it, it's tough. Um, here's the deal. In my experience, no healthcare business is fully compliant with HIPAA. That's just a fact. And a lot of times they don't want to know. <laughs> like, so... I think your best bet would be targeting a business that has 
one or two people that are working in IT or information security, and then offering your services as an augment to their capabilities. Like, hey guys, I know you're super, super busy. You don't have time to do a proper risk assessment. Let me help you with that, right? Yep, IPSEC this week. IPSEC this week. I gotta, I gotta get my um, my questions lined up for this dude. Ah, uh, Toasty Pop saying Jose Alfredo could name his uh, company Threadicini Alfredo. Very funny. I like that. Um, uh, Wade Patterson saying some nice stuff. More than a leader, my dude. You're a cornerstone. I consider you on the same level as the great Heath Adams. Oh, thank you so much, Wade. I do love myself some Heath Adams. Uh, he's a great guy. You two didn't like you today, Leon. Leon VQZ. Oh, cool. Bad USB workshop with Digispark. Very nice. Uh, Leon, I don't know if you have that like on a YouTube channel or blog post, but that'd be pretty cool to share. Ah, Billy DP stumbled into us. Well, welcome. I'm, I'm glad, Billy DP, that you're here. Jerry's content's the only go-to for cyber, hands down. Thanks, Jezbo. That's very nice. I'd be interested in doing consulting, but it does seem challenging to find clients. Yeah, uh, it, it is, Akil. It is. That's the trick. That's why networking is so important. Here's the deal. With networking... You just guys, I'm I'm telling you right now, networking is so freaking valuable. Okay, I'll give you an example. Um, I know a lawyer. Okay, I don't normally network with lawyers, but I did network with a lawyer in my town. Okay, and occasionally, if I have like a lawyer question, right, I just send it over to him and I say, "Hey, can you help me with this?" And he's like, "Yeah, I can help you with that." And then you know he charges me a couple hundred bucks, but like, I you know I don't I didn't research lawyers. I just have one. Then somebody called him and said, hey, we just got attacked by a cyber crime and we don't know what to do. And he was like, oh, I've got a cyber guy. Here's his information. And then that guy called me. I was driving. So I so I was driving. I listened to the, the victim. The victim told me what's up. I said, hey, I hear you. I know what your issues are. Let me connect you with Eric Taylor at Barricade Cyber Solutions. This is perfect. I'm driving right now. This is what Eric's company does. It's perfect. Connected them. All of that was through networking. You, you see what I mean? Like, like, uh, and I don't know if it turned into a client for Barricade or not. It probably did. But like, my point is that was all networking. Okay. I like another example. I, um, it, it's very complicated and I'll reveal this all after it's settled. But, um, I reached out to somebody I reached out to somebody last week who's retiring and I said, Hey, listen, I know you're retiring in 45 days because they had just told me that like the week before I went for a run, figured this out. I said, I know you're retiring in 45 days. I've got a full-time job. I think you'd be perfect for you want to line it up. So on your 46th day, you start this job. They're like, huh, that sounds cool. Let's check it out. The job will never, ever, ever be posted. The terms are very flexible. This is what networking is. This is why I tell you about the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Yes, you can go through the front door and apply to an open position and compete with other people for that position, but it's far more successful to use the side door that somebody in your professional network has opened for you. You know what I mean? You ever run around the side door and there's a buddy there and they open the side door and you walk in? That's what networking is, guys, okay? Jesse Johnson saying that networking changed the trajectory of his entire career. It, it's 100%, 100%. And, and like, there's many ways to do it. Like Jesse Johnson just started a Security Plus study group. He's leading it. And now uh, I created a channel on the Simply Cyber Discord server. So if you're studying for Sec Plus and you want a community to study with, go on the Simply Cyber server, get on the Sec Plus study group channel and engage with people. But Jesse's leading that effort. I guarantee you at some point that will come back to pay dividends for Jesse for putting in that work, effort and energy. Scripting Kitty. I see Space Taco saying good question. So let me see what Scripting Kitty's question was. I'm like scrolling through chat right now, trying to find scripting Kitty's question. Um, 
Leonardo, all his jobs have come through networking. Nailed it. Uh, is there a way to get recruited by the government as an advers adversity towards particular country? What? Scripting Kitty says, is there a way to get recruited by the government as an adversity towards particular county? Um, Scripting Kitty, can you rephrase that question? I'm not, I, I'm not sure what you're asking. I mean, I get the part about recruited by the government, but do you mean like, you know, like you're a Russian citizen and the government's going to recruit you to do... To, to, to like because you understand Russian culture because you can understand Russian language or they want you to be like an agent posing and go undercover like what I don't understand the question yeah I think it's adversary too but I'm not I don't understand the question Anyone can connect me. So Isaiah Morris says, can anyone help him for PCI DSS roles or GRC roles in New York City or remote? Um, yeah, I'll leave that to the community. Um, if anyone knows of any PCI, uh, that's payment card industry. Uh, okay, so... Okay, so I, I'm, I guess I'm just going to assume what Scripting Kitty's asking. If you get um, recruited by the government, then you're an asset. Um, the CIA does this all this time in foreign countries. You become an asset. Um, they convince you to, you know, basically turn on your country. Um, I mean, you, I don't think you can really volunteer for that. There isn't a LinkedIn banner you can put around your profile photo that says, like, open to spy. Um, you know, so... Yeah, I'm not sure what um, Darknet Diaries episode people are referring to, but um, definitely hook that up. Scripting Kitty wants to hack the Russian government on the U.S. behalf. Okay. Um, yeah, there isn't really like proper uh, avenues to do that. You would just be asked through professional networking, I might add. Um, so, I mean, if you, if you, Scripting Kitty, if that was your absolute goal, um, what I would do is I would move to DC. I would start engaging with people in that space. I would s learn Russian. Um, this is a boatload of work in order to achieve that goal. Um, I would become kind of a policy expert on Russian cyber techniques and tactics. And then I would maybe become really good at bug bounty. So you start getting private conversations with individuals uh, and then eventually make yourself aware. Um, like it's what you're asking for is not easy. That would be an incredibly difficult um, objective to achieve. It's possible, but it would take you, it would probably take you years to achieve that goal with hyper focused effort on it. All right, what else we got? Yeah. Where is the free book on cyber, Scott Mac? Scott's asking, Scott, this right here, go to HTTPS slash slash simply sire.io slash book and download it here. Let me see this. All right. Let me see this really here. I'm, oh my God. The stupid like emo thing. Okay. Um, let's do this. You guys, I was going to leave. I was going to leave and now I'm, uh. I'm definitely hanging out longer. Okay. No problem, Scripting Kitty. Uh, did anyone answer the question about Baxter Cluis? Um, Ask that question again. I think it was Boyd Cluis. Marcus Seiler. That's funny. Uh, an American just got busted sneaking in North Korea. Uh-oh. American North Korea sneaking in arrested. I don't know if this is going to come right up. Now, these are 2018 stories. Uh, 2017, yeah. So I don't see a, I don't see it right now. All right. Uh, <laughs> 
Shadow Crab does bring up an interesting point. Scripting Kitty, you may have already imploded your goal. Um, <laughs> Billy DP says they want to be a data forensic analyst. How long it goes zero to pro? You know, Heath Adams said this really, really brilliantly. Um, time is, you can't really say it takes a month or two months or three months. It's like, what do you want to put into it? Like, if you wanted to get the PNPT and be an ethical hacker, you could do all the coursework in a week. You could take the PNPT next week, right? So you could be a qualified, on paper, ethical hacker professional in like two weeks. You wouldn't see your family. You'd probably stink because you weren't showering. You'd need a shave if you're a dude. But you could do it, right? So so saying how long does it take really is a challenging thing because time is a variable that we can adjust. Realistically, if you wanted to be a data forensic person, I would say, well, I mean, it really depends on what your background is. If you have no IT background, if you don't understand how memory is laid out on a disk, like you don't understand operating systems um, and file systems and page files and you know, linked lists and stuff like that, data structures, uh, you'd have to learn all of that first. And then you could do how to use autopsy or in case or FTK and stuff like that. So all said, Billy DP, if you went ham on it, I think really practically, I'd say a year, a year of hardcore work, um, learning and practical skills application, and you'd be good to go. Um, What's this guy saying? Mike T, I'm stuck in the corporate infosec rat race for 20 years and want to start a business. Any suggestions on where to start? Yeah, Mike T. Mike T, take a look at me, okay? So I was a 20 years infosec guy. I started my own business maybe six years ago as a side hustle doing information security GRC consulting, um, built a little network and and do the YouTube stuff, shared my knowledge. Um, you can do it. What I will tell you is there will be a period for two years, Mike, there's a period of two years where you are working your A off at least two years. Okay. Um, and it's just, it is what it is. It, if you're, unless you're going to quit, unless you're going to quit altogether and start a business, but know that you're not going to have any revenue coming in for the first six, nine months, right? So it's going to be really hard, which is why I did it as a side hustle. But there is a cost there. There is a quality of life cost. I personally, I compartmentalize all my work, my family, all these things. I have time for family. I have time for work. I have time for side business. I have time for school. Okay. So it's an F load of work, but you can do it. I would say about two years and then you can slowly start peeling away. Also, once you, um, once you're able to, you can begin to adjust, um, you know, like your demands. So like, for example, for example, I work, uh, at a current company right now, I have an agreement in place that like, I don't work a full 40 hours, right? Like I'm right now I'm streaming. I got up at eight. I got on stream at 8 a.m. I've been streaming for an hour and a half. I'm in the middle of a business work day. If I didn't get this cleared through my business, they might be like, why are you streaming Simply Cyber in the middle of the workday? That doesn't make any sense because I've already lined it up. You see what I'm saying? Like you have to begin to start eking out hours for the business and grow the business uh, unless you just quit cold turkey and, and go ham on your business. Network the crap out of your business in your community. You have to go to like business mixers, uh, rotary, um, small business stuff. If you're going to do government contracts, get in good with uh, local people who are already on contracts so you can sub to their contracts. I could do an entire course on how to start a business. Okay, Mike T, I hope, I hope what I'm telling you, it adds value. I'm going to do a lightning round now because I do have to boogie um, out of here. I'm going to do a lightning round now. Okay. Harish Kumar, can I use the word script kitty in my resume stating I know just enough about the programming? I would not use the term script kitty in your resume. Two reasons, Harish. One, HR doesn't know what script kitty means. 
Uh, two, it's kind of seen as derogatory now. I would just say, like, uh, I would use some type of qualifier around your level of expertise. So, like, proficient might mean more of an expert. Um, you know, you could say, you know, use the use the action verb like understand or recognize. Like, understand ethical hacking uh, techniques. Recognize, um, you know, web application vulnerability types, right? So uh, if you ever want, uh, just like, this is like kind of a, 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 tr a, a, okay. So in the world of education, there's a thing called Bloom's Taxonomy. Everybody knows about it. Uh, that's anybody. And when you're developing curriculum, this is what you're all about. So what I'm saying is use the proper word on your resume to define. Don't use script kitty, okay? The, the lower is more basic and at the top is more advanced, right? So there are action verbs, define, duplicate, memorize, repeat, state. You understand, you can explain ideas, right? So this sounds like maybe what script kitty is. Apply, use information in new situations, maybe not. I'm gonna say script kitty is understand, the blue bar, right? So you can classify type of things, you can describe, you can identify, you can recognize. Use Bloom's taxonomy, this is a huge value. I use it all the time, all right? All right. Um, again, this is lightning round. Billy DP, uh, we already answered your question. Mike T, we already answered your question. Angular, uh, I have an interview today for sec assistant position. Wish me luck. Oh yeah. Let's go Angular. Crush it. Crush it, crush it, crush it. Oh, I can't wait for tomorrow to hear how it went. Elite Gunslinger, uh, wants a question, uh, opinion on path. Currently a director, should I go VP then CISO or directly to CISO? Um, it depends what industry you're in. I feel like VPs are kind of thrown around. Honestly, elite gunslinger, um, CISOs are in high demand and there aren't a lot of them. If you're already a director, I would assume that you already understand how to manage people. I would understand that you understand the game of budgets and um, you know life cycle management, dealing with vendors, uh, evaluating products, all that, all the crap that goes, all the, <laughs> here's the thing. I wanted to be a CISO my whole life. And then when I got it, I was like, oh, this sucks. Like I'm not actually doing information security work, right? So like you, if you already know the pieces of corporate bureaucracy um, that go into a management leadership position, then you're ready for CISO, get on it. All right, guys. Um, I've got to get out of here. I want to thank all of you today for hanging out in the SC Cafe. I, we really got to get that channel stood up um, and doing all the chill stuff. Guys, I'm Jerry. This has been the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief. Thank you all so very much. Have a wonderful Tuesday, and I will see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Be good, everybody. Bye. I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts, and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content, and we'll see you in the next one.